Bruch Maboyim. Thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. Tonight, the uh, my thought lecture will be on the Jewish calendar. You know, we have recently celebrated the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah. Hanukkah was a holiday where we thank God Almighty for allowing us to be victorious over the mighty Greek Empire. That was whose intent was wiping out Jewish observance. Now, on a philosophical level, the Greeks really had no difficulty with Torah. In fact, they admired the wisdom of Torah so much that the first translation of Torah was written in Greek. We refer to it as the Septuagint, which alludes to the 70 sages that actually wrote the translation from Hebrew to Greek. Now, the Greeks had no problem with the Jews studying the Torah. Their objection was the Jews actually observing God's commandments. Now, in order to separate the Jews from their God, the Greeks prohibited the observance of four commandments that were given in the Torah. They were the Shabbat, circumcision, the observance of Torah and mitzvot, and the sanctification of the new month. Now, the first three restrictions that the Greeks imposed upon the Jewish nation really seem logical. After all, <clears throat> excuse me, their intent was to wean the nation away from serving their God. However, sanctifying the new moon, making a calendar, why would the Greeks be so concerned about that? Now this brings up an interesting fact. If someone were to ask you, what was the first commandment that God Almighty gave the Jewish nation when they left Egypt? Well, in the book of Exodus, in the portion of Bo, the 12th chapter begins with a commandment to sanctify the new month. This was the first commandment that God gave to Moshe. Strange. Why would God begin the laws of the Torah with this commandment? So we see that not only God, but even the Greeks understood the importance of this commandment. All of Judaism is connected to the establishment of the Jewish calendar. So why was the first commandment in the Torah given to the Jews as a nation to establish a calendar? To begin with, all the Jewish holidays that we celebrate are predicated on the Jewish calendar. We are, by our heritage, an agricultural nation. We are connected to the land. Now, reality would seem to contradict that statement. After all, there are many Jewish doctors, lawyers, accountants, businessmen. You know, farming doesn't seem to be high on the list of Jewish professions. Now, this fact is, of course, true. We have become a people of professionals, mainly for practical reasons. You see, we've been exiled from most every country that we have taken up residence in. Now, one can take their profession or a commodity such as diamonds with them when they are forced to leave. <clears throat> However, the soil of that host country, well, that you are leaving, that must stay. Somehow, all failures that occurred in our host country were all due to our presence the Jew, and all accomplishments were totally attributed to them. In reality, there is no country in the world where Jews have lived that did not benefit in some way from their citizenship. A religious Jew cannot live without a calendar. It directs our observance of the holidays, the Shabbat, our daily prayers, birthdays, yurtzeits. It plays a critical part in all the arenas of our lives. We see just how important the agricultural cycle is in Judaism and that the seventh month of the year, Nisan, is called the first month of the Hebrew calendar. And yet the first month of the year, Tishrei, the month when the first man was created, the Torah refers to as the seventh month. In the Jewish calendar, there are four new years. The first new year is in the month of Nisan, the first month of the Jewish calendar. With the arrival of the month of Nisan, we begin a new biblical year. It hosts the holiday of Passover, which begins on the 15th day of the month. Nisan is also the first of the Regalim, the pilgrim festivals, a time when all Jewish men were required to come to the site of the temple and to bring sacrifices before God Almighty. It also marked the beginning of the agricultural season with the beginning of the Omer, the barley offering that was brought in the temple on behalf of the people. The Israelites were forbidden to eat of the newly harvested grain until they brought the sacrifice on the Omer. 
Now, the first of Nisan was also used as a method to count the years of a king's reign. No matter how many or few months, weeks, or even days had passed in the previous year, when the first of Nisan arrived, it would begin a near, new year in the reign of, of a king. The second new year is in the month of El, the sixth month of the Hebrew calendar. It is called the new year for tithing of kosher animals that were born in that year. It is referred to as Meiser Behema, the tithing of the animals. The owner would gather all the kosher animals that were born in his herds that year and make them pass through a narrow chute one by one. He would count them individually and then he would mark every tenth animal with red paint. The tenth animal would be sanctified to God. That animal would be brought up in the temple where it would be sacrificed before God and then offered on the altar. The Kohanim, the priests, would receive their portion and the rest of the flesh of the animal was consumed by the owner, but only within the walls of Jerusalem. <clears throat> Excuse me. The third new year is called Rosh Hashanah, the new year. It is the holiday that we all celebrate on the first day of Tishrei, which is the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. This is a time when the whole world stands in judgment before God Almighty. It is also the birthday of Adam, the first man, since this was the day when he was created. On this day, we celebrate the coronation of our Father in Heaven as the King of the Universe. We also begin our count of the Shemitah cycle. Now, every seventh year, we are commanded by God to leave our fields fallow. Seven of these consecutive Shemitah cycles make up a jubilee year, the 50th year, with all of its laws. The fourth new year falls out on Tu B'Shvat, the 15th of the Shvat, which is the 11th month in the Hebrew calendar. It marks the Rosh Hashanah for trees. This is in reference to calculating the tithing from the harvest. Now, the tithing consisted of gifts given every year from the crops that were harvested during the six years of planting. The first tithing that a farmer would separate was truma. It consisted of approximately 2% of the harvest. It was given to a priest. Next, the farmer would separate 10% of his harvest <clears throat> to be given to a Levite. This was known as Meiser Rishon, the first tithing. Then the farmer would be required to separate another 10% of his harvest, and that was called Meiser Shani, the second tithing. On the first, second, fourth, and fifth years, the owner would be obligated to take his second tithing to Jerusalem. This tithing could only be eaten within the walls of Jerusalem. Then on the third and sixth years, this tithing was distributed to the poor, and it was called Miser Ani, the tithing of the poor. This is just a quick introduction to the Torah commandments of tithings. Now, the Jewish calendar is not solely lunar. It is, is what we call lunisolar, just like the ancient Macedonians, Babylonians, Egyptian, and Chinese calendars. Corresponding with all of the lunisircular calendars means that the Jewish calendar is in sync with the natural series of the moon and the sun. These astronomical phenomena helped determine the length of a day, a month, and a year, the months being reckoned according to the moon and the years according to the sun. Since all of these New Year's are related to the seasons, so we adjust our lunar calendar so that the first holiday of the year, Passover, will always fall out as the Torah commands, the Chodesh Ha'aviv, in the month of spring, a time when nature begins to blossom. Now, in order to assure that Passover is celebrated in its proper time, we adjust our lunar calendar. We do so by adding an extra month, the 13th month which we call Adr Shani, the second Adr. Now, the difference between the lunar and solar year is 11 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, and three and a third seconds. The solar month is approximately 29 and a half days. So by adjusting the months from 29 to 30 days, we compensate for the 12 hour plus difference between the lunar and the solar year. However, that still leaves us with an excess of 11 days yearly that we still have to make up. 
And so we add an extra month, as I mentioned before, known as Adar Shani. This phenomena help happens seven out of every 19 years. It occurs on the 3rd, 6th, 8th, 11th, 14th, 17th, and 19th years. These years are referred to as leap years. So it happens that every 19th years we synchronize both the lunar and solar calendars together. Now the Jewish months have a set number of days, what we call mole, full, and chaser, missing, which alludes to the months that are full, 30 days, and those that are missing, 29 days. Now the months go back and forth from 29 to 30 days. And now there are exce two exceptions to this procedure. <clears throat> Excuse me, they are the eighth and ninth months. The months of Mar Cheshvan and Kislev. To make the final adjustment to the calendar, these months can be either 29 or 30 days based on the yearly adjustment. So any Jewish year, interestingly enough, can contain either 353 days, 354 days, or 355 days. And in a leap year, 383, 384, or 385. Now, originally, there was really no fixed calendar. Each month, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Supreme Court, which sat in the Lishcha Sagozis, the chamber of stone in the temple, would sanctify the new month. The seven-day week comes by ordination of God Almighty himself. However, the holidays are determined by the sanctification of the Jewish court. God waits for them before he sits in judgment, even on the holiest day of the year, which alludes to the fact that God allows us to be partners with him in creation. And we witness this scenario with the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. God had originally intended to give the Torah, as we celebrate now on the sixth of the month of Sivan. However, Moshe, Moshe, our teacher, on his own, added an extra day of separation, which pushed off, pushed off the giving of the Torah to the seventh day of Sivan. And guess what? God agreed. Starting with the 30th day, the court would accept witnesses that claim they had seen the new moon the previous evening. After rigorous cross-examination of the witnesses' testimony was found to be factual, then the court would sanctify the month. Based on their decision, the previous month would be 29 days, with the 30th day as Rosh Chodesh, the first day of the next month. However, if no witnesses came, then the previous month would be 30 days automatically, and the 31st day would be the first day of the next month, with both the 30th and the 1st celebrated as Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the month. Now, in ancient times, after the court would sanctify the month, they would then send up smoke signals from one mountaintop to the next, signaling all the way to Babylon. This method was successful up until a group of dissidents who did not agree with all the decisions of the rabbis lit the fires at the wrong times. <clears throat> now, this was done... This was done to confuse the populace. The court was then forced to send riders on horseback to let the people who lived outside of Jerusalem and the country know exactly when the month was sanctified. This was essential so that the holidays could be celebrated on their proper date. Now these riders had to travel all the way to Babylon, so the rabbis added an extra day to the holidays, which we call Svekadioma, a question as to the day. This was done to ensure that all Jews even those in remote places where the riders could not reach in time, would still be able to celebrate the holidays properly. Now, since these Jews who lived far away from the temple could not know for certain if the month was sanctified as 29 or 30 days, so the rabbis decided to add another day to the holidays so that all of those outside the land of Israel would celebrate the holiday in unison. Those that lived in the land of Israel were close enough so that they would know for certain whether the month was 29 or 30 days, and so they celebrated only one day. However, the rabbis instituted that those who were too far away would then celebrate two days, one day that was Torahic and the other day that was rabbinic. Today, even though we have what we call a perpetual calendar, which means that we know exactly when the holidays fall out, still 
we continue to celebrate two days outside the land of Israel and only one day in the land of Israel. The reason given is, since it has become a custom of our nation, we continue to follow it. Now, in addition, there are other Kabbalistic reasons that are not within the scope of this thought. However, we do know that today the first day is Torahic, as a Torahic obligation, and the second day is a rabbinic ordination. This fact is important, since in certain cases, such as burying a dead a body, a dead person, on the second day of the Yom Tov, outside of Eretz Yisrael, there are actually places that allow someone to do it. So all the holidays are celebrated for only one day in the land of Israel. <clears throat> one day, that is, except <clears throat> the exception of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, where we celebrate an extra day even in the land of Israel. This additional day is referred to as Yom Arichta, one long day. Since the witnesses that saw the new moon at night would not be able to testify before the court earlier than the late morning or afternoon, there would be a question even in the land of Israel as to whether witnesses had testified or not. In reality, there would be no way for the populace to know whether the night before was the beginning of Rosh Hashanah or whether it was just another night. Based on this fact, the rabbis decided that even in the land of Israel, they would celebrate the new year for two days so as not to denigrate the sanctity of the day in any way. The calendar that we use today was established in the 4th century CE. At that time, Hillel II foresaw that the Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Supreme Court, would be disbanded. He understood that the nation would no longer be able to follow Sanhedrin-based calendar. And so he and his rabbinical court established what we call the professional calendar, one that we still follow today. He sanctified every month until the coming of the Messiah. May he come quickly and in our time. Now, in the Torah, the days of the week and the months of the year are referred to only by number. Each day of the week is connected to the next Shabbat. As it says, today is the first day towards the Shabbat, second day Shabbat, third, again, on and on. Now, according to Wikipedia, the seven days of the week are derived from the names of classical planets in Hellenistic astronomy. These, in turn, were named after contemporary deities, a system introduced by the Roman Empire. The Jerusalem Talmud tells us that the modern names of the months were adopted by the Jews who returned from Babylon at the onset of the Second Commonwealth in approximately the year 350 BCE. You know, it's strange that we would use names of Babylonian origin and not the numbers as they refer to in the Torah. So the Ramban states that the count of the months by number was to commemorate the exodus from Egypt. <clears throat> However, now that the Jewish nation were returning from their recent exile in Babylon, the Babylonian names of the months served as to commemorate the salvation of the nation and to remind us that God had redeemed them from a second exile. In addition, Judaism is unique in that we also have names for all the weeks of the year. When Orthodox Jews refer to a week, they do so by connecting to that portion of the Torah that will be read in the synagogue that week. For example, Shabbos Bracious, which alludes to the first Shabbos of the year. It is a week that we once again begin the reading of the Torah anew. They may also connect it by referring to a holiday that may be celebrated during that week. For example, Shabbos Hanukkah, the week that we'll be celebrating the holiday of Hanukkah. Now, the Jewish calendar is not connected to the sun, a solar year, it is connected to the moon, a lunar year. What do we learn from the association to the moon versus the sun? That even though there are less days in a lunar year, approximately 354, versus a solar year, 365, after a leap year, not only do we catch up to the solar calendar, we actually are ahead of the solar year. So too in a person's life. Sometimes one falls behind, but if one takes advantage of opportunities for repentance, not only can one make up for past transgressions, one can even surpass them. You know, our sages tell us that a Baal Tshuva, <clears throat> a repentant individual, is even greater than a tzaddik, a person who is truly righteous. Now, how are we to understand this concept? You know, when a person stands tall and tries to jump, 
they are limited as to how high they will actually be able to jump. However, if a person first crouches, when they descend, then from that position they have the ability to jump much higher than they would jumping from a standing position. We as people are compared to the moon, which wanes, but then waxes. So to the Jewish nation, though we were idol worshippers in Egypt, we were able to throw off our idols and merit to receive the Torah from God Almighty Himself on Mount Sinai. To show our total obedience to God, that idol that we served in Egypt, the sheep, has become the Paschal offering to God, based on opinion the Torah. So we have seen that the Jewish calendar is essential to our lives as religious individuals. It has directed and guided our lives from the birth of our nation to the coming of Shiach Zikainu. May he come quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it interesting and informative. Again, may God bless you with health and with safety and with happiness. Again, may all your blessings be good and true. And uh, again, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you again.